Right. So I already got a lot of questions during my talk and then several afterwards. And you know, many of you have ideas which you think that you may try out using these mechanisms. So I think Harsha was trying to say something. I think you can start with what you wanted to say. So give this mic to Harsha. Professor, uh, what I was trying to ask you in the corridor basically was that the second model that you described, it uh, closely resembles a, a sort of a puzzle that was given to us uh, without uh, knowing we had attempted it. Basically, the question is, is there a model or a universal model which can look at a certain set of strings and then predict the next set of strings? It's another way of saying that you have only two, uh, your memory size is only two. Based on that, you should be able to come up with a formula or a, what we used to call a formal automata using uh, which it should predict the next coming strings. Mm -hmm. We didn't know back then that it's a limitation on uh, Turing uh, machines. It's, it's actually a very well-known uh, 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 Godel's incompleteness theorem <laughs> basically is that. So that when you express that signal string length, that's that's one thing that really jogged my mind. Right. So I wanted to mention that because that, that problem resembles incompleteness. That's right. So I would actually ask uh, Sasidevan, can you highlight a little bit more on, you know, yeah, so, I, so, I, so can you give the microphone to him? I think there is an additional defining feature of that uh, situation is it's, it's basically used to model situations in which uh, resources are scarce and there are a lot of people who crowd for that. So there is actually a inbuilt minority feature. You just don't want to, you, you, your prediction is uh, what is going to be the minority in the next, but then there is no solution for that, which is applicable to all because if everybody predicts that, you know, one of them is going to be the minority side, everybody will take that uh, negating uh, that belief. So, so I think that is the uh, defining feature of uh, that particular game. And uh, like I mentioned in the morning, that you know, here we had sort of two resources, like which I can call zero one, but you can generalize that to n resources. And so, what happens is like instead of so, you have n resources, and these could be like you know n. 10 computers and then users, and you're allocating all the users to computers. So I have these you know, resources, and you are allocating them. Now, if all of the users go and queue up in one, then all the others are unutilized. So it's not an efficient system. Now, if I had a dictator and I could tell, you know, you go to this machine, the other goes to this machine, this could, then there would be efficient allocation. However, often what happens is, you know, we land up uh, spontaneously. And so if there are n such, you know, resources and small n number of users, and small n is greater than capital N, then there will be always some who may be dissatisfied or frustrated. So this one was actually formulated by Professor Bikas Chakravarti and others, and it was called the Kolkata Paisa Restaurant in one way. And then this can be mapped to a lot of other resource allocation, even the parking space problem. Like, suppose I have a parking space in front of an office, and you would like to park your car closest to your office. But then when you go there, you find that it has already been taken off. Then what you would have to do is you have to come back and then again go. Now this parking space allocation also can be shown that you can map it to this problem. Okay, then you can have what is called the stable marriage problem. So you have men and women and they have their preferences and you would like to match them. So all these, you know, matching problems can be actually, you know, cast into this. Yeah. Is this similar to the resident matching problem? Yeah, yeah. So, so Professor Vijay was here and he used to wait for the final. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, can you repeat your question, please? <laughs> Sorry, uh, what I was trying to ask was, is this similar to the resident matching problem that Professor Vijay Vazirani proposes using something called as algorithmic game theory? That's right. So what happens is all this general class of resource allocation or recommendation systems, they work on similar basis. You would have to, you know, tweak the things a little bit, but then you can show that all of them have similar behavior. And so, like, very simple thing, like, 
if I just thought that I would allocate them randomly, you know, then you can show very easily that you know 63% of the people will be satisfied and 37% will not be satisfied. And now you give a ranking to these and you tell them to follow the history of the ranking and then choose, you will find that sometimes the efficiency goes down and then you have to find effective strategies so that the efficiency of allocation actually goes up. So there have been several works done by Onindo, Diptesh in I am Ahmedabad, then Oshim and Onob, yeah, they are physicists actually. So they've formulated a lot of strategies you know, how to allocate these resources effectively. And then when the resources become, you know, this capital N goes to two, that becomes a minority game of which I was describing, you know, and that's easily done. So you had some work on this information content and, yeah. So would you like to make one or two comments on that, you know? Yeah, you can come onto the board and, you know, and describe your work also. Yeah, so I think, so, so I'll just basically talk about one interesting issue uh, which can be addressed using this kind of a setting is uh, how does, for example, uh, information coarse graining affect collective behavior in such a system? So I'll repeat that, that the idea is that, uh, you know, we are looking at a collective behavior, okay? How many agents are uh, occupying either A or B or zero or one? Of course, uh, I think he has already written there, 50-51 kind of distribution is the most uh, optimal from uh, a society point of view. Now, the point is that the agents can uh, utilize various kinds of information to make their decision. So I think in what Professor Arnab talked about, he's just, uh, he, he mentioned that each agent looks at which side was the minority in the past couple of days. But that's just only one type of information. So you can have more uh, detailed information, like how many agents were there in one of the sites. So instead of the identity of the minority site, how many exactly agents were there in uh, one of the sites in the past uh, few days or something like that. Uh, so the interesting, one of the interesting results we obtained is that uh, if you have a collection of agents, then uh, suppose everybody is using one particular kind of coarse graining, okay, meaning that mm, they use uh, detailed information, but maybe not so detailed, okay. Uh, you can have gradations of uh, information. Uh, for example, you can distinguish only between, let's say, uh, in lots of five, okay? So for example, if there are zero, one, two, three, or four, five people in one side, uh, you treat it as one. You cannot distinguish uh, any finer than uh, that. So in that kind of a setting, uh, we just showed that uh, an agent who has actually uh, quantitatively less information uh, can actually perform better, meaning that uh, they can get a better payoff and so on. So the, the bottom line is not that result. The bottom line is that this kind of a setting uh, can be used uh, to uh, address uh, those kind of questions. So th that's one problem, uh, an extension of uh, this kind of work. Yes. Shrinka. Coming to yeah. the extension. I would request you to actually introduce yourself also when you ask a question. That will help us to get us yes, no, better. No? So that was Sasi Devan. He is now an assistant professor at QSAT in Kochi. And that's Harsha Krishna, whom you've already heard. So you kindly introduce yourself and then ask the question. Shrinka, I'm an assistant professor with University of Kolani. Well, coming to the extension of your resource allocation problem, I would like to ask that not all objects can uh, can be allocated as a whole. There are many uh, many instances where we need to uh, allocate a fraction of a resource. So how can we extend this kind of a work to such scenarios? Right. So this was the discrete case, you know, where we have things. But uh, probably you can, uh, you know, we have some analytical work done by some Italians and uh, French people, and they have uh, considered, you know, if I have a collection of resources where I don't have discrete but even uh, continuum, how to do that. But uh, uh, in in terms of uh, like the mechanism, probably like it's it's almost similar, except that you will have to fine tune your you know ways to find the strategy. So what happens is to find the optimal strategy is not always easy. So in most of these games, you have Nash equilibria, but to find those Nash equilibria is not very easy. That's the NP hard problem most of the time. 
And so I think uh, even in physics, using physics tools, they have shown that, you know, you know that there are Nash equilibria, but to find those are not very easy. And so the optimal allocation is not always possible and to find. Many times it also happens, we are not interested in Nash equilibria, but right. the social uh, choice, uh, that is a separate thing. and. Many times fairness. Uh, right. So even the Pareto optimality choice. is different from the Nash equilibrium. So they have shown these things that you know some solutions will be Pareto optimal, but not necessarily Nash equilibria. And in other cases, you, you know, so some it's often better to have the Pareto optimal cases. But in not all the games or the formulations, you can find those Pareto. Yeah, and we kind of face this kind of scenarios in auctions. Uh, right. This energy auction, mm. which. Um, uh, Abhi mentioned, yeah. Mm. So it is. I don't think it is so much prevalent in India, but it is coming up as uh, when we have renewable energies, right. we sort of go into an energy auction mode where mm -hmm. many people are participating and we kind of allocate uh, in quantum. Mm -hmm. So there, this kind of scenarios occur, and we are more interested in the social choice uh, than an Ash equilibria. Right. So uh, converging to a social choice. Right. Yeah. So many of the engineers actually use optimal control theory to do those approaches. So I actually had a paper with TCS again for dynamic pricing of renewable energy thing, and there we use optimal control to find you know the best allocation or how would you price when depending on the usage and the price searches. So you know there are different possible directions which you can use to go from here and elsewhere. So, if you have any other suggestions or, you know, way questions, uh, I think uh, Dr. Dibbendu Maiti, you had some points to make, yeah. So, if you can kindly introduce yourself for me. <laughs> well, I'm Dibbendu Maiti, I work at the Delhi School of Economics. See, um, so obviously, um, you sp spoke a couple of interesting issues in tried to analyze uh, many interesting phenomena that we see uh, using you know, physics law or something. Now, what could be missing? I don't know. I mean, it could be I have misunderstood a couple of things. When we see a problem, being an economist, that we always think something that you know I'm I'm going to suggest something to the policymakers or maybe individual or institutions. Um, you know, if there is inconsistency or inefficiency, so that they could come up with some kind of some 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 kind of policy signal is supposed to be sent out. Now, if I take out one of your example, let's say you talk about that saving an uh, inequality. Now. So there are standard theories that you know why saving is supposed to be let's say uh, 30 percent or 50 percent. Why saving in developing countries is higher than developed countries? There are standard theories in economics. There are leading scholars that have worked on that. And obviously, that means suppose being an individual, why I'm supposed to save, uh, save something? I have some kind of optimization problem, and I'm supposed to smooth up your uh, whole lifetime utilities. So that you know, I should not consume everything, so that I can um, save something for the future. Now, uh, without considering some of those structure behavioral things, now then, if I simply randomly inject some of the assumption, mm -hmm. obviously there are a whole lot of random e events hitting on on my head. It has to be accounted for. But still, still, some of the structure thing still has to be added. Then you add some of those, and I think that should be much more constructive. I, this is my so general that, suggestion. I don't know. I mean, I mean, obviously, for that, a lot of interaction uh, back and forth is supposed to be happening. I, I, I fully understand. I think. Right. Yeah. Then I think we can actually say whether the structural behavior or there is random factor are moving you out of uh, you know stable equilibrium to get. Multiple or divergence, something like that can right. No, very very good point actually, which you brought up. Like uh, we should, you know, this uh, that you know your Gini index goes down when you increase your savings. Okay. So this was this lambda, and it was going down like this. Now, one good like my suggestion was that you know if I 
savings depending on and i told you that if you look at you know who are the people who are in the tail pareto tail normally they are found to have very high saving propensity and uh, now what we can do is suppose i would want to become wealthier so i would actually be in, interested in increasing my savings so you can make that lambda proportional to your you know wealth you already have and you can build these models so reinforcement learning so you will change your saving parameter according to you know what you already have or you want to do yeah yeah now yes yeah just <laughs> Now, uh, when you are saying that the saving propensity is more, right. so are you looking at the wealthier peoples? Uh, yes. So if you look at so the tail, there, so you will there find is a that possibility that the wealthier peoples are not actually the most uh, 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 the people who are having the most uh, saving propensity because uh, they can spend more because they know that they, they have a lot of uh, lots of wealth. Right. But what happens is like this. You know, suppose we in our model we say that okay, you go to trade. Okay, now often if I am a poor person, I'll put my entire wealth into the trade, whereas a rich person will only put in a small amount or a matching amount, you know? and a huge percentage actually it will save, and it's quite likely, and that's where I had actually shown another model where suppose I make a slight variant that okay, if there are two users and you know one has M1 and the other one has M2 wealth, okay, uh, we will put actually the minimum of this in for interaction okay and then we will split it randomly okay but what happens so this you understand what happens earlier what i was doing is i had a wealth you know m1 you had a wealth m2 i was saving a lambda m1 you were saving lambda m2 and one minus lambda into m1 plus m2 was being shared now what i do is i have 100 1000 rupees so the minimum so i will also put 100 you will also put 100 and that will be split randomly now, if I just change the rule, you can find that this will go and produce an instability where only one person will have all the wealth and this will become zero. Because what will happen is I will continuously trade with you and then throw you off the market till you I mean, can reach zero. Okay? And so initially I was getting those you know, stable stationary solutions. But here I will get an instability and you'll find all of them will, all the wealth will come to only one person. Now this this model again we cannot show analytically, but using simulations and maybe counter uh, sorry just by argument you can show that this will be the solution. Now what I'm saying is that you change these rules slightly, and your behavior becomes very different. And so you know this behavioral economics, how we actually save, or what could be the factors which get in you know increase your uh, what, you, what, what you were telling, that incentive to save. Now that becomes very important. And this is where I think we should work with economists and you know, put this thing into value rate. Right? So a very good suggestion, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so, on, so following up on, on what uh, you mentioned, right. I think uh, economic fundamentals, if we keep in mind and then go ahead, is, is very, very, very good. Uh, two two aspects particularly. So if we can uh, look into this, and, and while he also mentioned, like uh, we interact with each other because there is some business or there is some trade that we are doing. So if we look at a national context, can we model that, like the work that people are doing with each other and the interaction between that, and then um, possibly then see what are the type of roles that will evolve, type of job roles and things of that nature. That's that's one. And the other one is uh, on the international trade between countries, what we trade and what they, what each country gains out of it to try and understand uh, what is, where is it going. So the whole, whole objective of modeling each of this one is a within country and the other is with, uh, between countries is to predict what can happen in the future. I think that is where a lot of my interest lies and, and if you, I don't know if can do it using the models. Right. That will be something interesting. You were suggesting similar things, right? Where the performance of the countries could be yeah. also modeled using yeah, right. game theory. So, so yeah. yeah. So, so just give his uh, microphone. I'm Devojit. Uh, I teach in OPG Indel Global University. So uh, what I, uh, I was suggesting that, uh, okay, uh, one thing that uh, uh, earlier the assumption was, he, 
the economy's transition path, maybe the GDP transition paths will be very uniform. But uh, actually, if we if we look at the especially the developing countries, then we often see that some countries are going uh, uh, very fast for a particular time period, and then it collapses, like uh, um, Latin American countries in the 60s and 70s. Then again, it picked up, right? So the, if we look at the overall distribution of all the countries, then what we'll find that uh, some uh, say ki, the richer country is going down, uh, poorer country is going up, or maybe the richer countries are uh, growing up and the poorer countries are going down. And in between, there are some countries which are, uh, which are catching up with the uh, rich countries. Some of the uh, middle income countries are uh, catching up uh, with the uh, poorer countries. Or maybe there is a crisscross uh, between themselves. So uh, the similar kind of graph you were uh, showing with the with the game, and all these things are happening due to some kind of choice or policies, right? Now, if we if we make this kind of uh, choice or policies as a strategy of attracting different kind of maybe uh, FDI or different kind of things that can grow our economy, then we can have a similar kind of path that you were showing. So uh, I think in that way, uh, uh, if, we, if we can think of a country's uh, reforms in terms of the strategy that they are taking for their development, then a similar kind of model can be built. So are you on the same page you're talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, depend. I, I can take a different page. <laughs> no, I, I think if you're really interested to see the extent of this trade uh, to be flowing between the country, and if you want to forecast, there are standard technical tools that you can use, uh, which is known the gravity model. Gravity model, yeah. And yeah. that is also after Newton's law, no. So X1, X2 divided yes, by X2, X2. distance between them. Dex, yeah, two mass, product of two mass by distance. So here, basically, mass is basically GDP. Yeah. And the distance is not physical distance. Physical distance could be one component, but right. to extent of barrier you create between two countries. Right. So let's say in this case, you know, uh, India and Pakistan are far, although they are geographically, um, you know, neighbor countries, but so then the extent of barrier you could actually mid, mm, measure. So this is, there, are, there are interesting approaches are also being used using gravity. So this is probably in the different ways. Uh, in the same way. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I think, see, I think uh, that is what I think the traditional model is. I think the, the, the objective is to do and try in, and think about this traditional things in a new way. I'm, that's what I'm assuming is, a, is one of the objective. I don't know, I might be wrong. Because see, I'm not a trained economist, so I can I can talk anything that's why <laughs> and you have to correct me. Uh, so I think, again, I think what uh, you are telling, I think, uh, makes a lot of sense. Because I think, see, we have to, if we can model something and we have to predict the future. Right. If, if, if we do not get a prediction, uh, Ability, capability, then where do we use the model? Right. Use has to come. He's talking like a computer scientist now, machine learning and artificial. So that's what yeah. machine learning people do actually. Yeah. They will train the data and then they will. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, that's a very practical approach, like we're saying. So, so that's most. Also, also something we, we really need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We economists, especially economicians, we have. Really so this, if you can. Predicting and yeah, so if you can customers. introduce yourself and then, yeah. I'm Tushan Mundi. Uh, I'm from Center for Studies in Social Science in Calcutta, and I do econometrics. So, no, no. so the, the thing I was trying to say is, uh, in terms of, I mean, to build new models or new way of thinking for forecasting and prediction is very important because that's the uh, area where we economists fail a lot. Okay. So uh, maybe I mean, with new tools, new uh, algorithm, we can economize that. Computer scientists can work with the computer focus. So, just uh, one thing, uh, like I would like to kind of add to this comment. I mean, I think what he wanted to say, uh, I would put the same thing in a different word. Like the kind of models or physical laws you are using for economic problems, etc. That's fine. In, in economics, you also use a different kind of model. But in our model, the structure defines 
policy parameters, what the Binda wanted to say, that is missing. Right, okay? right. So if you can have that innovation, then it becomes very easy to say something about the policy. True. Am I right? Yeah. So I translated what he said. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'm Alexandre Fers, a postdoc in IIC. So I think it's more a general question for economists or people that apply policies, and it's more from a computer science point of view. So now nowadays we're able to make robots working just by learning themselves in some way. You know, you train them on simulation model, and then with some kind of reinforcement learning approach, exactly what you were saying you can learn by yourself uh, how to walk. Uh, can we use, so at least this is what I'm trying to sell in our centers, by putting some sensors, smart meters and so on, can we try to adapt policy, uh, economic policy, for example, pricing policy over the time with just algorithm? And of course, you, there is always a human in the loop to check. And it's just more the question is, are you economists trying to go in this direction? Is this something that is of interest? or? You don't believe at all in that. So I think in India you are still doing it in some way. But, but yeah. Oh. All right. Uh, just to add one point, um, there was recently, I think, on uh, towards the end of March, a meeting at Vatican City, which is on called Genius Machines. It was on using these AI platforms for different security purposes. But there was one person from the IRS who, uh, of the US who's mentioning how they are using these platforms to allocate and to check all of these uh, different aspects that you were mentioning. So different governments all over the world are using those. China is using a lot. I'm not sure what to do there. <laughs> but, uh, a lot of places are. Um, India has had an AI task force since 1992. Mm. So the like very adaptive, you know. So yeah, the yeah. Big thing is, so do you want your electricity bill, the price of your electricity bill, to adapt all the time? Do you want to receive advertisement of yeah. what kind of appliance you want? You should buy today tomorrow. Basically, all the recommendations that were in Netflix, for example, you can try to translate the system for Ashish. appliance. Yeah, so, oh, one <laughs> It's not for me, it's for the world. Repeat everything. There's a punishment for not taking the money. And in that exact order, no? we cannot. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm just saying, uh, do you believe that like kind of this recommendation systems that we have in social networks and Netflix can be used for application of incentives in economy? And I'm not sure whether or not people are agree or not with that and whether or not it's a good direction, but more a question to the general audience. So, so things of this nature uh, are, are being used in, uh, uh, not only in, in, in China, but in a lot of the other economies, but they use it as a form of a nudge, like behavioral nudge that they use where they tell you to do things in a certain way, where they tell you like, say if you are paying your electricity bill late, they will send you a reminder that 80% of the your neighborhood have paid the electricity bill. So that's one way to do it. And there are the online shopping, uh, like the travel shopping, they always hike your travel price if you have searched for say one, one location two times in the last two days. They know your preference, you're liking to go there. So those you know, sort of things are already happening uh, quite a lot. But no, but for example, as a French, I know that my country will hate that and population will hate that. Mm -hmm. We hate when there is incentive direct to us and so on and where you try. Because when it's clear that someone is trying to play on new psychology, I'm telling you, yeah. it will be terrible in France, at least. Yeah, that's how. No, maybe. Thank. Okay, Parangu Yes. Yeah, this is a change of topic, so I think this is completed. So I'm interested in the linguistic problem which you addressed. Okay. And uh, what I gathered that you have this data right. from some Mexican. Uh, Mazatec languages. Uh, yeah. States. And what exactly did you do with the data? I missed that point. Okay. 
Fine. So I have... Uh, in short, maybe. Sure, sure. I have some suggestions. Yeah, yeah, sure. So what we did was like this. There were about 311 nouns, okay? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you give this set of words to different people from all the different cities. Okay. And then you look out... Alex. Yeah, you... Yeah, you hear you know how they pronounce it. Mm -hmm. You convert it into international phonetic alphabet, and then you measure the Levenstein distance. Yeah, that part yeah? I understood. Right. Then what you do is like this. Suppose I have the distance matrix, so I know, yeah, right. you know, that what is the distance between dialect from city one, city two, city three, and all. Now you can do many things. One is you can use network theory. So you put a link above a certain threshold. And so you got some correlation between the distance and this. Uh... Right. So what, what happened was we saw something interesting. So, you know, whenever there is mobility among the people and there is exchange, then the dialects become similar. Okay. So we found that, you know, there are all the lowland languages mm -hmm. and they, of course, have very similar uh, among themselves. Then the highland languages are also very similar because there is mobility, mm -hmm. but not so similar uh, between the highland and the lowland. Okay. But then we find that there is a similarity between one of these languages, which was on the, you know, extreme west and extreme east. And then we went back and checked in the history that actually there was a dam which was built in 1954, which displaced those people. And they found that their professions are very similar to the lowland. And they thought that we will not be able to compete. So they would rather migrate in very inside. And then they saw that, yeah, there's a similarity between these. Okay. So uh, right. as a theoretician, I'm yeah. interested in, did you look at the distribution of these distances? And did it have any interesting features? Right. So the, the number of surveys that they did, actually, I was telling you, these were done by the linguists. So they went to the villages and collected the data. But it's not very large enough to calculate the distributions. So my right. next suggestion is, yes. why don't we try to do something this in India? Right. For example, one thing can be that within one language, as, right. a, as an example, you said Bengali has right. many versions. Right. But also you see that our different languages, they are also quite close, like right. Bengali, then Hindi, Hindi. Hindi. Right. And we can sort of uh, find out the so-called distances right. uh, for the same word, how people are pronouncing it. I don't know whether those things have been done. True. Some models have been done, like bit string models. Yes. Like right. So, so it will be a nice uh, comparison. Excellent. Yeah. So I, I actually gave a lecture, a full-fledged lecture on this, and I said that our motivation was initially to, you know, uh, model the Indian language system. But the problem, like what she's saying, we have about 1,635 mother tongues, okay? No, and no, yeah, 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 I understand. So we can take only the probably the Indo-European group of languages in one, or the Dravidian languages in one. Here. Yeah, yeah. And then you will try to see that main problem is getting the data because but what you happened? We have a school of languages in. Yeah. So the linguistic department, we got into uh, we touch with uh, this one professor called Girish Cha. He works on computational linguistics. So he's trying to get data from Nagaland, Manipur. And uh, no, for the northeast, yes, the yeah, for the timing, uh, yeah, and it's easier because you know they use they have these languages, but they use the Roman script basically to, uh, to, to write. Not all, yeah, of, not them, all of them, yeah. Really, yeah. And so we're trying to get that data. Once it is done, probably we'll be able to do some analysis, That's right? Yeah, right. Uh, especially if there is some universal features or not. That true, true. So that's yes, Eleanor. So, so they're basic, so, so basically can, can, entire... can you introduce yourself in uh, one I'm, I'm uh, Eleanor Power. I'm from the London School of Economics. Um, there's basically an entire field called cultural phylogenetics, which, which tries to do this with standard uh, sets of, of words um, from across the globe and has been done with good resolution that's been replicated many times for particular uh, language groups. So it's especially been done for Austronesia, Mm -hmm. um, and a set of the Bantu languages in Africa. And so for a few other places, we have very good uh, cultural phylogenetics based on uh, the linguistic analysis with this distance analysis sort of thing, using basically the same tools that you'd be using for genetic phylogenetics mm -hmm. as, as, as the tool there. So some of that work has been done. That's right. And uh, on top of that, I didn't mention in the morning, so the linguists also know you know, in which direction the language flows because, you know, they know, for example, the phonetics, I think, v is more difficult than b. B is more difficult than p, okay? So if I just have a, you know, a word bava, 
that would be more difficult than you know baba baba would be more difficult than papa baba uh, that would be more so you could actually trace you know how the language has moved so they use both this you know spatio and temporal you know rules to you know find out you know how this language has evolved right in which direction it has diffused and then there are whole group of uh, actually models uh, mathematical models in using differential equations where they modeled a language competition so there was originally a paper by abrams and strogatz yeah that one so that's a very classic uh, paper uh, I think uh, with Shagor we were trying to read a few of them and <laughs> uh, thing, but uh, mathematicians have modeled the different types of uh, competition, language competitions, and you can also have the multi-agent formalisms. And um, yeah, any other question? Uh, so not a question so how do we go ahead from here <laughs> so the idea is actually we want to you know listen to all the you know different speakers over these next four days and then if we can form collaborations like what we are realizing that in our models we don't have a structure but that's when you know the economists can tell us you know how do you incorporate the structure into our models and then we would perhaps be able to produce better models one second like I, we were trying to use a data science approach and uh, ashish will present a little bit of that you know linking so we in, in, in link the gini inequality to savings right but then we found that you know there are other socio economic factors you know which influence savings or you know influence the gdp thing and there are correlations and not always the causality or causal relations can be deduced but you can study these correlations so we want to take your help actually yeah, so i think maybe as a for the first day what uh, sir is telling is that hmm. uh, if we can take the data for the indian perspective because for me india is what <laughs> interest only right. uh, the indian perspective data and come up with those some of those coefficient gini coefficient for Indian context using the advanced methods like you and using the traditional methods and see how much they are in in sync to each other. Right. I think that might be a good first step to even publish something. Sure, sure. That's what I will also present a little bit to work on finance and relation to macroeconomic dynamics. And so, like we wanted to, at that, I'll talk on Wednesday. And there, I know that a lot of you can actually give a lot of inputs, mm -hmm. valuable inputs, because you know you all work on macroeconomics, and we have this network approach which we can combine. So, what we are trying to do, I'll just give you a little bit thing that you know the economy can be broken up into several layers. So, you have multi-layered networks, and you know one layer influences the movements in another. So, we showed you know. For example, the trade, the FDI network, the trade network also has influence on the financial network. So, if you look at the uh, financial uh, market fluctuations, these are often driven by the other macroeconomic dynamics. But so, where we use the standard economic te techniques to you know find the empirical linkages. But I think that's somewhere, you know, some point where we can you know all collaborate together. People coming from finance, you know, economics. And data science people and use these tools to build more, you know, probably I think more useful models and also do that prediction type of thing, you know. So tomorrow I think there will be a talk by Professor Anand Srivastam Azim Premji. He'll be talking about production network. Then Tushar will be talking on Wednesday on taxation network. Uh, Susan, what are you going to talk on? Market structure. Okay, market structure, Ma market microstructure, yeah, awesome, right. So, the, 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 like, that's what we want to see actually, and then we want to see how we can actually join hands and you know produce uh, better models or analysis. Yes. On the last point, uh, what are we? Exp is that the kind of question that was asked? What is it that we? Are trying to do in this so I, I mean we all have different ideas about uh, how to go about it but one of the things I feel is that um, all of you uh, and all of us coming from different departments and different areas should also try to introduce these methods in our teaching courses 
For example, um, I don't know of any mathematics department in India which teaches game theory, genetic algorithms, agent-based modeling. Why is it so? Of course, computer science has taken over game theory and they have their own departments, but that's not, uh, I mean, time series analysis, which is based on stochastic processes, but very rarely that in colleges and universities, you would see a mathematics department which is teaching all these courses. So there's some way we would like to also tell that, and students are very interested in working in these areas, you know, they are much smarter than us, they want to, they know where the world is moving, they know where, what the problems are there to work on. And these are the methods that people are using rather than the same number theory and differential equations. So one of the things we would like to show or see that how these methodologies should come into mainstream mathematical sciences, computational sciences, or whatever, and mainstream physics, or the only ICER I know that ever taught game theory was in a biology department, not even mathematics department. So in a way to bring people together so that uh, these become more, uh, you know, methods become more, um, you know, widely taught so that, and, and the problems that these methods uh, address then would be uh, kind of uh, approached by many other people who are, come from very different kind of background. One of the things that definitely helps in these areas is if you come from a different subject, you come with a different set of I ideas. So it always helps. That's how the interdisciplinary stuff works. That people come from different backgrounds and they give in their expertise and ways of thinking into putting the, uh, bringing the area up. So that is one of the things I especially, since I'm a teacher, I really would like to see it. In this particular case, we have done it for other subjects earlier, but in this particular case, these are the problems that are all around us and we would really like it to be, you know, come to mainstream mathematical and, uh, uh, and other sciences, physical sciences and mathematical sciences. So that's, uh, I also had a small question if somebody, Others don't have. So I keep hearing a lot about game theory, especially today we heard. Now for if every particular situation, I, my background in physics and then later in computational biology teaches me that there will be certain universalities and then there are specifics for each. But when I hear game theory talks, I always see that they are so rooted into each and every behavioral rules or the agents and their properties, that to me there doesn't seem to be anything that is general. So is there anything other than national equilibrium? Uh, is there anything that one could say, oh, here is a top level model, and from which I could go into different sets of specifics, so this sort of problems can be handled this way, that sort of problems can be handled that way, or I don't know how to talk about it, but uh, that's kind of way of, uh, in physics, a lot of these are done. Like you have very general models and then specifics get into as parameters as certain kinds of interactions. But the general models remain. So is there anything like that in game theory, which uh, there are a lot of people who are uh, theoretical people. So I would, uh, so my name is Sagar. I'm from IIT Kanpur Physics Department. Uh, so first, uh, in response, not quite response, a comment against the comment you made about this, you know, having subjects in uh, more basic sciences like physics, chemistry, and having game theory in there. So uh, the thing is, at least in IIT Kanpur, I started it one year back. Uh, the main challenge essentially was this prejudice of physicists who don't really well, maybe they are right to think that game theory is not a part of physics because almost none of the uh, quote unquote fundamental physics problems are to be described by game theory. We have more fundamental models to describe them starting from, from quantum mechanics, we have Schrodinger equation for mechanics, you have Newton's law, you go beat up, you have relativity and everything. But then if uh, one could argue out that ultimately, of course, everything boils down to quark gluons and all those things, but 
phenomena have to be at the level of different scales and explanation has to come at different scales. Essentially, whatever is the argument of complex system, uh, if the case could be built, then people can be swayed uh, towards you and then one can, uh, you know, make subjects and get it passed through. So, for example, I could uh, propose a course on evolutionary game theory, but I didn't name it evolutionary game theory because if I call it evolutionary game theory, then the problem is it's not a part of physics anyway. So I called the course evolutionary game dynamics. <laughs> and then it was also good for me because my background is from complex, I mean, uh, nonlinear dynamics. So I could use the models of stochastic processes and uh, dynamics, chaos theory and all that. And then essentially end up doing a little bit of uh, classical game theory, a little bit of evolutionary game theory, and then stochastic process going from finite systems to infinite systems and all that. Uh, in IIT Kanpur, we have the flexibility of giving elective courses. So what I'm saying is it's actually possible, but uh, one has to think of it a bit, uh, come up with some good, uh, you know, sort of justify that how it goes through, find some friends and uh, we can push it. So at least I'm happy that in IIT Kanpur we have course and last time I gave, I had 30 students, but from 10 different departments. So it was extremely exciting to have different kinds of ideas. I mean, sometimes you felt these questions can't even be asked, but from the perspective of, I mean, we have a student, we have some student on cognitive sciences, and asking questions which I would never have thought. So it was very exciting. So I agree that it should be done, but there are practical problems, but I feel that can be circumvented too. But there has to be wish to do it, in the core physics part. Uh, I mean, the core physics faculty should think that it could be done. Otherwise, you know, the, all the students who come to join PhD in, let's say, in IIT Kanpur, most of them would say, I want to either do high energy physics or condensed matter experiment. And it has started actually from colleges of Calcutta. I mean, as um, Anirbandha was saying that, you know, first you have to learn Bengali, then probably in physics. So point being that most of the students are coming from Calcutta. But the known teachers, the known motivators, are actually motivating people towards high energy, not because the, they are prejudiced, but mostly because that's what they know. They have not developed their idea beyond a certain thing. So change has to come from colleges and all that. So in that context, I had one more session. I don't know, I mean, some of you might be in rather higher level committees of Indian government, all that thing. Parangomati can tell actually. Parangomati. Uh, I had one suggestion that if in school we could have, you know, I was in CBS in KV. So we used to have in English uh, literature, we used to have this book called Read for Pleasure. So that was not in main text, but that was uh, side text and we could read that. So if we could have some sort of Read for Pleasure in science streams, like interdisciplinary Read for Pleasure text, which has things from chemistry, things from math, things from biology, things from everything, and saying science is very interdisciplinary and you can connect things. There we can introduce things, things come from school, go to college, people are aware. Otherwise, the only thing after class 12, mother and father tells is uh, go and either be engineer or a doctor, or your failure. So, I mean, this is still there. Uh, okay, so maybe I uh, spoke a lot on this, but the other thing, the more technical thing which you were talking about, I think a uh, little bit of universality is there if you connect evolutionary games and dynamics. Because there are these things called folk theorems which relate the equilibria of the game theory with the dynamical system uh, limit sets like periodic orbits, fixed points and all those things and they connect it. And we already know that in dynamical systems we have universalities uh, like phi one constants and all that. So I have a feeling that if this dynamical system theory and the evolutionary game uh, theory, I mean, they are connected through proper equations, there some universality classes will be there. But the way you are asking that if I have different classes of games, how do they come up with some universal exponents, uh, that would actually depend on probably dynamics. But dynamics, I don't think in classical game there is sort of a universal dynamics. People come with imitation dynamics, this dynamics, that dynamics. So that's my feeling. Okay. Yeah. So to 
Next one is response by. Yeah. Nowadays we have a lot of outreach programs in which uh, either people go to the colleges or the uh, students are invited for talks and uh, they are uh, to inspire them, many people are brought from outside and so on. But it is true that I think that uh, romanticism is lacking in these subjects compared to say astrophysics and high energy. Uh, so whatever they cannot see uh, through naked eyes, like you have to use a telescope or you can't see like in the atomic level, that excites the students much more. And also the media is there, like when Higgs boson was uh, discovered, see the kind of coverage it got. And any, in any case, if you just go through the regular say, genres or the popular genres, they write about particle physics, they write about these the, many other things, but they, they don't write about complex networks, however interesting we might think them to be. So maybe at that level also we need to communicate with the people, I mean also the media we have to, like in this type of a conference we could have invited some people from press, that might have helped, I don't know. What kind of universality you are talking about? Because it's clear for you what she's talking about, but for me, um, I'm completely lost. <laughs> and I'm just doing the so, what uh, is? so, what happens is like this. Uh, what uh, he's saying, or what did he say? Is that in physics, you have certain models, okay? And then when you look at the dynamics, the particular details of those you know, systems do not matter, but the dynamical behavior have some universal properties. And so what we call critical dynamics that, you know, if you just boil water and it goes to a from gas, you know, so you have a phase transition. Now the behavior of that phase transition is very similar to what you have in a like magnet, ferromagnet and paramagnet. So that transition. So that's what we call, we don't go into the details of the system, whether it's a liquid gas system or, you know, ferromagnet, paramagnet system, but the dynamics near those phase transitions or what we call critical points are very similar. And that's what we call universal behavior. Now, this whole physics started developing in the 60s and 70s, and now we have very well-known theories which explain all these things. So she's saying that, you know, she, her observation is you've, she has seen a lot of game theoretical models, and they are so different. Are there any ways that we can, you know, classify them into certain groups which would have similar properties in terms of, yeah, you know. Now, now I understand. Right. So, <laughs> and so there are already some classification. Potential game and all these things. You have thousands of, let, let's say you have five big classification, and most of the time it's about the property of the trajectory, whether or not there is unicity of the equilibria, and whether or not, um, and whether or not uh, some learning mechanism will converge and so on. So these are existing. But then about like kind of physics laws that you will be able to um, find in all the games uh, are extremely hard. For example, the only result that we know about Nash equilibrium is uh, the set of Nash equilibrium is there is a finite number of connex components. That's it. And we cannot do more except if we add property and so on. So I think then, then, of course, you have classification of equilibrium, you have the Nash equilibrium, you have the correlated equilibrium, you have the Bayesian Nash, you have the dynamic, and you can prove that this one is included in this one, and so on, but I think that you will... So, to what I understand, it will be really hard to find a kind of general physics law, like universal laws that capture all of that. Just because of the complexity of the equilibrium, just coming also from that. I think uh, Shagor was pointing out to similar that only in terms of dynamics, maybe we can classify them into certain, uh, you know, classes. So if you compare the dynamical properties in... I'm going to make one comment. Sure, sure, yeah. I think we have the guy who's working for long. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Okay, let me, let me ask. Yes. Um, it's hard to um, in game theory, obviously there are structural few games uh, where, let's say, depending on the agent behavior, we'll be able to get one mass equal. Cannot find many mass. Suppose, let's say, we are playing one type of game. We have uh, one solution. Now, if we repeat the game, 
there will be another solution. Obviously, you also, the solution is also named after Nas, because we keep repeating his name, because he invented this kind of thing. So, under uh, certain properties, uh, assumption of the individual behaviors, you can bring this kind of assumptions. Uh, I, I don't think there are not more, but when we apply some of those let's say in biology or physics in political science we apply, we try to use this narrative and try to see whether these properties are old or not. Now, let's say in my particular case, course there are properties, you know, to get the solution out of this, uh, uh, let's say dynamic or backward index, whatever we say, uh, are being hold or not. Then if that is not being hold, then you have to find you have to solve, and then you find another solution that could be named not come another message. So then it is, there is extension of the message. So that's why the subject has actually moved and expanded. So there is not not many, to my understanding. Uh, but uh, but when you present, you have to say to you, in this kind of game, what properties of the particular game are being satisfied? If one particular property in this case from my subject is not involved, then how are we going to solve that? Are we, are, we, are we using different technique to solve? Then if you're uh, solving that, then how much it is different from the originally not changing the assumption, how much is different from that? Then that would be different altogether. This, this is this is what my now after uh, getting the information of the evolution of dynamics. I, I got a fear that I will be losing job soon. <laughs> <laughs> because we we obviously it's uh, you know we have I I think in Delhi schools we have five or six campaign course uh, teaching. Um, no, I mean this is very interesting. I know we need to uh, uh, you know institutionalize different over different subjects as well. But at the same time, what I feel, see. Why do we use game? Game is applied in certain context where agents has different interests. Suppose if you are trying to analyze a uh, you know movement of matter, let's say they can move randomly, but now agents he and me in, in uh, identical circumstances we can actually be different. They need to understand why you have actually move. Uh, it's something different. So then you have to start the game. Now, what is more interesting that under identical circumstances, we are, we are behaving differently. And then in the back of mind, we are, we are supposed to assume something, that's why we come, uh, we've got different solutions. Now, how are you going to actually Using backward index and using probabilistic uh, theory or something like that, uh, are used to solve that. There we need a lot of input from mathematics and physics. Sometimes we are really constrained by uh, techniques to be used to solve that. Probably there, I think we need more kind of conversations. You know, because we economic by discipline is to understand the behavior. And obviously, physics, you have your mandate to understand the matter, everything, and properties, something. Then you have to understand that how I'm going to solve some of the stuff that is something more than more complex. Thank you. Yes, Shagor. Uh, hello. Yeah, sir. Now, I just wanted to clarify one thing because sometimes, you know, when we are hearing a new term, we can just try to interpret it. Uh, as if it's in an English dictionary. So this is our pro So when we say universality, like uh, Professor Shumdatari said, it's much more complicated than we were quite discussing. I mean, it's not about just classifying things in similar looking sets. Uh, in physics, it would mean that those sets are so unique that if I take those sets of games and uh, let the games be played in whichever fashion, whichever agent, it spit out certain experimentally measurable numbers to some changes of the payoff elements, let's say by uh, cardinal changes or whatever, those experimental measurable number does not change. 
then the answer is no. Yeah, so that's the problem. That's what I was saying. So it's no, it's it's, that's robust in physics. It seems it's extremely hard in game theory. Mm. So and nobody has nobody has even yet tried going out of that direction. Oh, they have tried. They have tried many years ago. So in the mathematical game theory, mm. they have tried, and okay. it's so easy to create each time a counter example where you perturbate a bit of epsilon, and the number of Nash equilibrium is exploding, and so. On. Except for specific game. Any other question or comment? Or? Yeah, so just one. Yeah. Uh, not long, we do have, not long, we do have uh, certain properties which are similar. Apart from just Nash, we have a uh, sharpless algorithm. And those which we considered, uh, if I'm not wrong, in your, in your terms, universal laws. Uh, because these are particular ways that people will act, and then there are certain conditions which are taken to be in such a manner. The entire idea is that you can have certain differences within this, and you can go deeper into it. So you can have the entire idea of an equilibrium, or beyond that also, like um, the Sharpless algorithm or Sarmelo's algorithm that we do discuss in game theory. Apart from that, you can see how does that work in different situations when actors behave in this manner, in that manner, how are agents interacting. So you can have certain more modulation. As for uh, the other part where you want the students to interact more, just saying that um, in my university where I graduated from, we had to take classes from other disciplines. So I had my uh, compulsory courses, I had my electives, and apart from that, certain electives had to be from another discipline. So I had to take certain course of law, I had to take certain course of anthropology, certain course of history, and whatever. These are courses which are being offered. Same I think is in uh, national law universities right now in uh, in India. So perhaps uh, so they have people specifically from those disciplines who are coming to teach. So they have a person on, say, political science, one from sociology, one from English literature, that they have to study, regardless of their focus on law. Perhaps something like that could be done in your know, colleges as well. So, but making it compulsory that you have to take at least. But then you're not taking. Uh, but could the compulsory courses in the other disciplines? Right. So in the new education policy that they have. See, it is said that if you are from science background, you have to take two papers from humanities subjects and vice versa. It causes some problem. <laughs> no, these measures are being taken actually. The has made a certain strict rule, so every university has to follow it, and it's right to that. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's on. It's on. I think. Okay. Um, but is it also people don't take game theory class and so on just because the system is too competitive? And for example, when you have to pass gate, you know what you have to study to enter in one of the IITs and so on, and you don't want to dis like you don't want to take something else because you know where you should go to enter in an exam and so on. And now you brought a very sensitive issue. Actually, yeah. the students, don't, don't the know. students will actually. Yeah. The no. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is like this. It's not so streamlined. Not streamlined. Yeah. And second, what you're telling is that the priorities and preferences of students are very different from in how when teachers you are now view. Exam. That's of course, you will be a bit optimal in your choice such that you succeed, right? Right. So that, that's actually a game theory between the students and teachers, you know. So <laughs> they have a different you know, point of interest and we have a different point of interest. But actually what uh, she brought up, you know, in, in a new education policy, they're bringing a lot of changes uh, so that interdisciplinarity is introduced at the school level and uh, continues till the, you know, master's level. Now, how well it is implemented, that is also a problem because, you know, we come from some of the premier institutions in the country and we face challenges and I was telling that you know what goes on in the remote villages is even very difficult to fathom. We don't even understand you know the problems they're going. Yes, there was it. So probably the last comment because we're yeah, five thirty. We can continue these discussions, you know. That's that's what we want actually. Such discussions to continue. Yes.
So in economics, a similar kind of thing, uh, we face that, uh, especially after 2008 financial crash, that uh, the macroeconomics is not being able to uh, forecast or explain the things and how to come out of that. And one response from the uh, students was uh, that's, uh, that why not to change the economics uh, teaching entirely, what Shang uh, uh, was telling. Uh, uh, so uh, actually, so in economics, the response is coming in the form of changing the uh, the undergrad uh, textbooks, right? So uh, and uh, and uh, in 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 that effort, a large number of people are working together. So uh, I think that can be an idea, and uh, and in that uh, they are taking the account of history, the even even some of the existing ideas that is uh, within economics, but but specifically taught in higher level studies. But uh, how to uh, how we can incorporate those in the undergrad uh, teaching, so that uh, students get immediately interested and at least uh, know about these fields. In, uh, in very early in their career. Right. So let me make a comment and end this discussion, and we can continue this tomorrow. So one criticism that has been, you know, especially after the subprime crisis in 2008, is that you know, e economics had become too axiomatic in its approach, so too theoretical and very far away from the empirical data and analysis. And that's where actually we can join hands, like I was telling you know, people coming from data science, computer science, uh, who are used to you know, coding algorithm thing, you know, analyzing large amount of data. And physicists you know, have these ways of incorporating very simple models, but then with a lot of heterogeneity. And we have to bring in an approach which is interdisciplinary. So we can continue these discussions in the following days. And I think uh, today's discussion was quite well. Thank you, all of you, and we continue tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, we continue at 9.30 tomorrow. Thank you.